great service is a service that was full of shouting and dancing and they danced and danced until they were sweating and then the, <sighs> the prayer service was wonderful the service was great now is that a great service because you danced and you shouted maybe maybe not for some others a great service is a service where lots of people give their hearts to Christ so, wow many people give their hearts to Christ in that service is that a great service well for some others a great service is a service where many people were healed oh that was a great service what's a great service what's a great service what's a great service it reminds me of Catherine Kuhlman's story when she was a little girl and uh, she said every Monday her mother washed she did the laundry every Monday and um, on this particular Monday there was a, a message that had come home that a relative was ill and uh, she wanted to go and visit so she had packed the clothes together ready for laundering before the message came so she had to leave and she left Catherine in the house and Catherine said I thought I would surprise my mother I want her to know she's got a big girl now at home she was about nine years old somewhere so she said before mommy comes back I would wash everything for her so she packed all the clothes the cottons, the woolens, the linens, the fast colors, everything, the white ones, everything. And she packed them all into the, the basin and turned the water on. And she did the washing. And then she put them on the line. She couldn't wait for mommy to come back. She was all the time pacing the floor. Where's mommy? What she was waiting for was the look on her face when she saw the great work done by her wonderful daughter. So she waited and waited and waited until finally, towards evening time, mommy came. And all the time she was following mommy around and wondering why won't she come to the laundry to see what's happened here. <laughs> then she said she took a look at the clothes and um, she said I thought they looked a little different. But somehow maybe this is what always happens when she does it. So she called mommy in to the laundry and mommy just um what have you done where are the clothes she said then mommy stepped forward and looked stupefied and she looked at her daughter she said you did a wonderful job <laughs> And Catherine said, I think those were the hardest words that my mother had to utter. In other words, she, she had difficulty saying those things. But you know what? You got it right. She damaged the clothes. They were all spoiled. But mommy said, you did a wonderful job. The reason for that story was she was thinking 
How many times have we done something for God and we thought it was wonderful and maybe we damaged it? It's not enough for us to feel it was wonderful. What does God think? Does God think the same way? When we praise and dance, does God think it was wonderful? When we pray to God in the way we pray to God and we feel wonderful, does God think it was wonderful? If you're ever going to know what God really thinks about what you do and the way you do what you do and what you say and the way you say what you say, if you're ever going to know how God really feels about it, you've got to know the word. You've got to know the word. You've got to know the word. That's the only way. You've got to know the word. Without accurate knowledge of the word of God, you can't serve God correctly. I like some of the, you see, the, 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 the uh, terms that Jesus used many times in his speeches. For example, when he said, um, uh, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Why did he say, I am the true vine? Because there were other vines. You see, he said, I am the true vine. It's not enough to be a vine. He had to define himself. I am the true vine. Then he said, I am the good shepherd. Not just a shepherd, but the good shepherd. I am the light. Then he was called, this is the true light that lighted everyone that cometh into the world. He's the true vine. He's the good shepherd. He's the true light. Very important that we know who we're dealing with and how to deal with him. There are people who say, well, you can serve God any way you want to. No, that's confusion. God will have to show the people how to worship Him. Remember the words of Jesus in the fourth chapter of St. John's Gospel, in His encounter with the, the woman from Samaria. Remember His words? He said, God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, you know, in, in, in many places they say, let us worship God. And so, uh, uh, they say, let's worship him in spirit. And that means... Let everybody keep quiet. So it's a moment of silence. After a few seconds or so, may the Lord hear our prayers and let our cries come up to thee. Something's wrong. We didn't say anything. No, somebody said, no, no, but we were in the spirit. That's why we were quiet. And well, that's the, you see, that's the, that's the idea that the man has about being in the spirit. Where did he get it from? Anywhere else, but not the Bible. He didn't get it from the Bible. That's not the way. See, the Bible doesn't say to be in the spirit means to shut your trap. 
that's not what the Bible says. That you're quiet doesn't mean you're in the spirit. So if you keep quiet and just think, doesn't mean you're in the spirit. So you can't just be quiet for 30 seconds and say, May the Lord hear our prayers. That we didn't pray. We didn't pray. When Jesus prayed, the Bible says, and he said, he said, he said, and his words were written. When the apostles prayed, they prayed, they were heard, the words could be written. When the prophets prayed, same thing. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he didn't say, when ye pray, think. No, he said, say, our Father. He said, say it. Praise the Lord. In other words, through our knowledge of the Word of God, we can tell whether or not we are doing what is right. Because a lot of times there are people who say, well, it depends on which church. You know, some, church, some churches say this and some churches say that. We never can tell which one is really right. It depends on the interpretation. No, God is not that confused. All right? He's not that confused. The Word of God is clear. The Word of God is made available to us. You can tell what is right by studying the word for yourself. Asked the fellow one time, do you speak in tongues? He said, I'm not a Pentecostal. I said, I'm not a Pentecostal either. Well, you, you can still speak in tongues. The Bible doesn't talk about Pentecost. All right? The only thing about Pentecost in the scripture is a celebration. Didn't call anybody Pentecostal. In fact, the people who received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost were those who were not celebrating Pentecost. Didn't you notice it? All the Pentecostals were outside and didn't receive the Holy Ghost. No, no, it's, it's an irony. You know, all over the world, if you ask people who is a Pentecostal, and I'm not critical of Pentecostals, just telling the truth. See, if you ask people who is a Pentecostal, I mean, you study in the Bible schools, the, the, the definition of Pentecostalism is the, the, the denominational Christianity that believes in speaking in tongues arising from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And it's terrible because that day all the Pentecostal celebrants didn't speak in tongues. Only those who were not celebrating Pentecost and were in the upper room refusing to celebrate Pentecost were the ones who received the Holy Ghost. So where did they get it from? No, you, you, you know, the things that people do, you just wonder how they come about these things. So many assumptions. And then people wonder why their lives are the way they go when their, their lives are based on assumptions. Just because someone has believed something for 60 years doesn't make it right. Now, do you mean to change? I mean, I've, I've believed this thing for so many years. Doesn't matter. That's the, you could have had a glorious life. Now, I told you one time, you know, there, there are people who no matter what's happening, they don't, they're not going to change a thing. <laughs> You know, there's a man, you know, he was on his dying bed. Why he was on his dying bed, he remembered um, he was distributing his property and all those kind of things, you know. Give this to that, give this to that. This is his dying bed, you know. Give this. Then he remembered that other son. He said, no, don't give him anything. He was still angry. He's dying. And you know, there are those who have a problem with a neighbor. And they believe that even, even if it is hell, I will wrestle him in hell. <laughs> they are so mad, so angry. If it's their last breath, they're going to use it for the fight. Because hatred has taken over their minds. And they don't think they should change that. 
You see, the question sometimes we need to ask ourselves is, hey, how happy do you want to be? How fulfilled do you want to be? How successful do you want to be? See, you, you, can, you can live to your best potentials through the Word of God. To your best potentials. Nothing places a limit on you if you go through the Word. Nothing. You will be an absolute victor with absolute mastery in your life. Oh, but you see, the fact is, that's the life that Jesus brought to us. That's the life. That's the life he brought to us. I I'll show you a, a, a portion of the Bible. Oh boy. Do you love the Bible? Yes. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. We, we stopped at the 20, 27th verse the other day, right? Okay. Let's speak up from there. Book of Romans. Oh, glory to God. From verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, before I go ahead, just a, a testimony. I'm sure some of you have already been informed that we got a letter from a, a, a gentleman who said that after our teaching last, last week, last Sunday, you know, um, we got to talking about praying in the spirit, okay? Being led by the spirit to pray like this. And how the, the Holy Ghost bears us up in our weaknesses, in our limitations. You remember that teaching? Okay. So he said, um, uh, they were at home. And in the night time, he was awakened by the Spirit. In the middle of the night to pray. And he prayed in tongues and prayed in tongues and prayed in tongues for a long while. And in the morning, he still felt that way. So much urge to pray in the spirit and his wife joined in and they prayed in the spirit and then finally they went to work somewhere in the afternoon or so they got a message something had happened at home the water tank the water tank loaded with water came crashing down the neighbor's water tank crashed into their bedroom right on their bed i mean the devil wanted to kill them he couldn't Because he doesn't have the power. So that thing crashed on their bed. They brought me the pictures. What happened that night? I believe that thing wanted to give way that night. But the Holy Ghost didn't let him. Glory to God. He wanted to give way that night. This guy had this unusual, you know, unrest in his spirits. And he was speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues. And the angels had to stay it. Listen, when you speak in tongues, you give instructions to angelic beings. You have to understand that the Bible calls them spirits ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are heirs of salvation the minister for us that means the minister on our behalf 
It's different from if the word of God had said minister to us. No, but it says the minister for us. In other words, they are our servants. But how do we know when to give instructions about things we don't know? How would they have figured out that the tank was right over their bed? They didn't know it. The ceiling would have covered it. Didn't have the idea that thing was going to give way that night. But speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. And the groaning in the spirits. Because he had an unrest in his spirits. Groaning. And when they were clean, gone out, the thing crashed down. Thanks be unto God. I told you, speak it in tongues and save your life. Are you listening? Don't take it lightly. There are reasons we've got to speak in tongues. And pray in the Holy Ghost. And have these groanings. You see, we can't start out and say, okay, I'm, I want to groan now. No, it's the Holy Ghost that takes over. But you've got to start out by speaking in tongues because you can speak in tongues yourself. But when you begin speaking in tongues, the Spirit of God, if there is something that needs to be dealt with, He will take over for you. Because already you're speaking the language of the Spirit. There are many things that we can change in our lives if we would only speak in tongues. Many things will change in our lives. Many, many things we will stop from happening. There are things that have persisted for long because someone wasn't speaking in tongues. Something could have happened a year ago and it's still lingering. Something could have happened for you five years ago. You prayed about it. God answered. How come you didn't see it? How come you didn't have it manifested as you wanted? If you were speaking in tongues, you would have gained the mastery. Are you still there? All right, well, you know, that was last week. There's something that won't show you here. Verse, where are we? 29, right? Okay. For whom he did foreknow, this is Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. <laughs> oh. I wish you would look this scripture this verse we're reading here is too powerful it's too powerful read it together that verse 29 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh I've meditated on that verse for days. You know what I mean? I couldn't get off of it. The scriptures like this, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you how, you know, how to get something out of God's word. When I studied that verse, I meditated on it for days. I'll go and do other things. I'll get back to it and I'm still reading that verse. Excited. I couldn't get off of that verse. Let's read it. Come on. Mm. <laughs> for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son God knew me before I was born did you ever stop to think about turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 
Book of Jeremiah chapter 1. Have you seen it? Now if you came to the church with only New Testament Bible free not to be sold. You can't find Jeremiah. All right, are you there? Okay, read for me. Verse 5. One, two, go. Oh, see, I'm trying to calm down so I can talk to you properly and share with you. Otherwise, I would have been running around this place, I'm telling you. Because inside me, I'm actually running. I'm just walking slowly here, but I'm running inside. You know what it is? Look, what would have gone through the mind of the man, Jeremiah, when God said to him, before I formed you, I knew you. Look at it. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He was chosen before he was born. Okay, so God, is God so limited? He only knew Jeremiah? So God didn't know I was coming? If he is God, he should have known I was coming too. So it's not only Jeremiah. It was written for us as well. So before I was formed, hallelujah. You see that? You're not an accident. Your mom and your dad could tell you, look boy, we, we, we weren't planning for you. We wanted to stop at number three. You were number four. You were a mistake. Well, you may be their mistake, but you are not God's mistake. <laughs> I ever tell you about the, the beautiful lady, you know, she was about 52 years old. And she was crying. And I'm about ministering to her and just crying. I said, madam, how old are you? She said, I'm 52. I said, why are you crying? She said, because I was told that my mother wanted to abort me when I was born. Uh, I said, how old are you? 52. I said, you mean you've been unhappy ever since? Yes. I've never been able to get it out of my mind. I said, you're here now. You've spent 52 years already. And she'd never been happy. She was married with children, but she'd never been happy. I took a few minutes to inject the word of God into her. And get her thinking differently. And I did. Praise God. See, there are people who are not happy because of what they've gone through. All her life she was thinking, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be dead. My mother didn't want me. I'm supposed to be dead. That's the way she thought all her life. So she, she, she became 52. Because nobody told her. Nobody told her she was not an accident. Nobody told her. You know, when we share the word of God, it's not our idea. It's the word of God. And so the anointing of God is upon it to get it into the hearts and the spirits of men. So when I say to a woman like that, you're not an accident, it's not the same way a friend, anybody else who say to her, you're not an accident. No, no, no. Our words are anointed. When we say to someone, you're not an accident, goes right into the spirit and dispels fear. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> Let's look at that verse now. Back to verse 29. For whom he did for no. <laughs> for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be confirmed. To the image of his son. <laughs> I...
He says, the one that God foreknew and loved or God interested in, you see, the word for know here is more than just knowing about someone. It means special interest. God's got special interest in us because of Jesus Christ. He says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate. That means he planned ahead of time. He planned ahead of time. He planned your life ahead of time. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be confirmed to the image of his son. In other words, God planned to make you follow in the direction, in the likeness of his son Jesus. He planned it. Let me read it for you to, to you from the Amplified Version. For those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness in other words my life is going in the direction of the son of god i'll never fail in my life can you see that there's a plan about me god has a plan he chose before I was born that I be conformed to the image of Christ. He planned that my life would go in that direction to be like Christ. You see, when I studied that song, that, 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 that word, what I just read to you, I began to think again. Those songs I used to sing. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I want to be like him, all through life's journey, from head to glory, all I want is to be like him, to be like Jesus, to be like, to be, to be like Jesus. Yes, nice song, but when you come to this verse, you stop singing it like that. You stop, to be, I want, all I want is to be, you stop that. You go, Father, I was born to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. Oh. Now I'm staring. Oh. Praise God forevermore. He planned for me to be like Jesus. He planned it. He predestinated me to be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. This is not my desire. This is his desire. Glory like that. Oh! Hi! Ah! Ah! Mm. So it's God's plan for me. So from, you know, from that point you say, I know how my life is going to be. I know how my life is going to be. I'm journeying in the image of Christ. I know how my life is going to be. You see, you may make some mistakes, but you're on your way. The Bible says you were predestinated to be conformed. No matter what devil, I'm journeying in that direction. I will be what God planned for me to be. God's desire is right there. He says that he, that Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, he wants others to be like him. Huh. What was Jesus like? That becomes a question. What was he like? You know, a lot of us... Uh, it, <sighs> let me tell you this. Some people have suffered for so long in poverty, in self 
defeat self-condemnation for so long they don't know what it is to be happy so it's difficult to try to change their mind but you see until you change your thinking nobody can help you you've got to get it clear and sometimes you talk to people about the situation and you say all right now here's what you're going to do here's what the word again no 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 I've tried all that they want a quick fix slap me on the head they're in a hurry no it's not that way you want a lasting solution get to the word you must be willing to change your way of thinking you must be willing to change your way of thinking until you are willing to change your way of thinking nobody and nothing even if God sat in front of you he couldn't help you why because he's already sitting inside you and he couldn't help see the Bible says without faith Hebrews 11 6 without faith it is impossible to please him he says it is impossible you can't please God without faith no matter what you do you if you want to cry cry you just be crying as you're crying he doesn't hear you the Bible says if we ask according to his will he hears us what do you mean asking according to his will it means asking in the way he told you to ask that's according to the word If you don't ask in God's way, you get nothing. Haven't you noticed there are people who have been praying about the same thing for a long, long time? It's just that part of prayer. Oh, Father, remember my uncle. Oh, Father, remember that job I told you about three years ago. I'm still, I'm still very expectant. <laughs> it has become a normal thing when will your prayer finally be answered i know you have answered it oh lord i'm just waiting for the manifestation that's talk that's talk jesus got results john the baptist didn't look like he did you, you didn't get it his disciples were going around with him all the time you know and they heard john pray but they saw no miracles they saw nothing happen no change they, they knew he always prayed i mean he was a jew so they knew he prayed all jews prayed but when they saw this other the one he testified of when he said be open ah. so did you see that when he said rise and walk ah! <laughs> so they came to him and said did you read how two of his disciples two of John's disciples came to Jesus they came to ask him questions master wh where do you stay <laughs> because you see they had been with John for a long time Locusts and honey was their food. <laughs> and they slept in the wilderness all the time. It was cold. And they covered themselves with skin. So they said, Master, where do you stay? Every, everything I'm telling you is inside the Bible. <laughs> so, so, where do you stay? Jesus said, Come and see. I love Jesus. They followed him home. When they got home with Jesus, they discussed and talked and talked and talked and didn't stop they played a fast one on Jesus it's in the book finally they pretended like they wanted to go so because they had to go now then they opened the door to see that it's dark then Jesus said it's already dark why don't you just stay uh -huh. <laughs> read your Bible they never left again they remained with Jesus they never went back to John
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because they noticed Jesus got results. What do you think when you read your Bible and you see men like uh, Jehoshaphat when he prayed? King Asa when he prayed. David when he prayed. They prayed once. Don't you understand? You are praying many times about the same thing. This, well, let me give you a simple story. Asa, for example, was surrounded by enemy soldiers numbering over one million. And he didn't have enough to face them. He prayed to God when they informed him that he had been surrounded. He said, oh God. We have no might against this multitude. Oh. I. He said, oh God, we have no might against this multitude. Our eyes are on you. And then he said, and now in your name, we go out against this multitude. Now, <laughs> I hope you know that's a risk. I mean, no, no, you think about it. You think of the fact that you prayed many times and sometimes it was as though God answered and sometimes you didn't know whether he answered. So you weren't sure whether or not he was answering. So you prayed and you prayed and sometimes you hit it and sometimes you didn't. Imagine if this were one of those times. <laughs> and you're going out against a million men. It was either you submitted and stayed alive. Or you fought and died but now this man knows he's in for it he knows he doesn't have enough to face the enemy and he says oh God in thy name we go out against this multitude and then he charged out look as I read the Bible and said I, I said God the man prayed once and got out He prayed once and God responded, saved the man's life and saved all Israel. He prayed once. Can I pray only once in such a situation and go out? Lord, can I pray only once? I'm facing a very serious exam and I've studied. Can I pray only once? Can I trust that God will hear me? Then in comes Jehoshaphat. Three nations come out against Judah. And there's no way out. And Jehoshaphat calls all of Judah to prayer. It's time for prayer. Oh, hallelujah. There's so much to learn in the word of God. A man has someone threatening his job in the office. He comes home, sitting down and, and getting angry with his wife and his kids and everybody. You know, no, call for a prayer meeting. Don't get too proud. Call for a meeting. No, but you know, if you've been acting like the lion in the house, you can't call anybody for prayer when you're in trouble. I mean, you wake up like you're the lion in the house. I mean, Junior sees you in the morning and takes a dog. <laughs> All the children fly out. You, you can't do that. So when you got a challenge like this, you can't call anybody for prayer. Not even your wife. Who put this wood here? <laughs> You've got to change that. I understand they say that the African man must be a lion in the house. No. You are not an African man. You're a child of God. So when there's trouble, you call everybody. You say, come, let's pray. If that home is full of love, this is possible. You say, come, let's pray. And this was what Jehoshaphat did and called all, all of Judah together. 
He said, we are surrounded by three nations. We don't have power over them. We can't fight them. But our eyes are on God. Let's all fast and pray. And they fasted and prayed and prayed and prayed. As they prayed, somebody stood up and began to prophesy. He said, fear not, O Judah. And O King Jehoshaphat. He said, fear not. This battle is not your battle. He said, this battle is not your battle. He said, tomorrow, go out against them. He said, they're coming up by the cliff of Zeus. He said, you go out against them. God already said, you will not need to fight. Guess what Jehoshaphat did? After the prayer, he said, oh Judah, believe God's prophets. All right, believe God's word. We're going out. He put 20 soldiers, singers. They were not armed. He put them in front. He put singers in front. Will you try that? I mean, and the enemy's out there. And here come these big singers from Judah. Praise the Lord for his mercy endure forever. Praise the Lord for his mercy endure forever. Where are they going? To war. <laughs> They're going to war. They're going to war and they're making noise and singing without arms. Why? Because Jehoshaphat had prayed. He knew he had it made. He knew God had answered. Listen, when God answers you, it doesn't matter what was against you. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter learn to trust God if Jehoshaphat could pray once and be heard I can pray once and be heard Jesus said when you pray do not use vain repetitions do it, Lord. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. Until you are tired. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He's mine. He said, For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You're not heard because of the volume of your word. Faith in God's word is what's required. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God forevermore. He said, we were pre predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. Now, that should be your confession. That should be your confession. My life is for the glory of God. I was born to be conformed to the image of his son Jesus. You see it becomes your confession. And I'm getting better every day. You know there was a time I used to pray like this. I'd say oh Lord because I saw it in the Bible you know. Uh. David had those words. Hide me in the shadow of thy wings. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Isn't that nice? No, no, even you just looking at me like that, you, you just felt like, what a prayer. <laughs> oh Lord, hide me in the shadow of thy wings. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. It's a good feeling. 
you know, you feel like God has seen your humility. And uh, so he will, okay, son, I'll hide you now. The next day I come again, hide me in the shadow of thy wings. Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Mm. <laughs> One day, I prayed it again. As I said, hide me. The Lord said, how many times am I going to hide you? <laughs> then I said, hide me. As I said, hide me. And I heard the spirit. I said, I am in the shadow. <laughs> I said, Lord, forgive me for praying this dumb prayer for so long. I'm so sorry. I've been saying the wrong thing. I am in the shadow of thy ways. Thou dost keep me as the apple of thine eye. I changed it. You see, because it's got to reflect truth. See what I mean? Hi. Yeah. That's the way the Word of God works. You make it personal and you put it to work for today. Look at Jesus when he was tempted by Satan. All right? Look at Jesus. Something happened. Can we, can we read it? You want to read it? So Luke's Gospel. So Luke's Gospel, chapter number four. You there? I'm trying to get there. And um, from verse 1 will be all right. Jesus. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended afterward, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Did you ever think Jesus could get hungry? He was. He was hungry after fasting somebody asked me one time is it right to be hungry when someone is fasting does it not mean that the fast has been spoiled for him to be hungry I said it's nice when you're hungry refuse to eat you're supposed to be hungry that's the idea of the fast if when you're fasting you don't feel hungry you haven't started you would feel hungry that's the idea that you're hungry and that's when self-denial comes in if you don't feel hungry when you fast, you haven't fasted yet. Continue until you're hungry. <laughs> and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. <laughs> and Jesus answered him, saying, It is written. I want you to notice the answer of Jesus. It is written. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, every word, every rhema of God. Now, there are two words that are popularly used for word in the New Testament. One is rhema and the other one is logos. All right. Now, you know, uh, logos is the a whole revelation of the body of truth all of the word of God all right and the, the revealed word of God that is logos and that's what the Bible says Jesus is the logos of God the living logos okay but Rhema is the logos of God on your lips that is the spoken word for the now it is called the now word 
Rhema is the word of God for a particular situation, for a particular person in the now of your life. That's Rhema. Rhema is uttered. Rhema is spoken. Rhema is the word of faith. It's different from Lalia, which is a speech. Even though spoken, it is a speech. Are you listening to this? Now, Jesus here said to Satan, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema. He didn't say by every logos. The word of God in your Bible is logos. The word of God in your heart is logos. You can lalia the word. That means you're just making a speech. You may just be talking. But when it's rhema, rhema is the faith word. Rhema is the spoken word. And it's the word for the now. It is, it's a word that's coming in sync with the spirit of God. Now you'll see why that is important. Notice Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, you may be reading the scripture and what you're getting is logos. And that may not make a difference. You can be enlightened by the logos of God. It may not change your life. It may not make an impact or a present impact until you get Rima. Now you get something in a moment. Watch this. You're still there. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every Rima of God. And the devil taking him up. That's verse 5. Onto an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time he showed to jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and the devil said unto him all this all this power will i give thee and the glory of them for that is the leave unto me and to whomsoever i will i give it if thou therefore will worship me all shall be thine and Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, I want to show you something that's very important. When we started reading, because you know, if you study this same portion, uh, this same story, or uh, a similar story, in St. Matthew's Gospel, you would notice there's a change in the arrangement. But something interesting is at the beginning of St. Luke's story, you'd find he said this temptation took place over a period of 40 days. Which means the devil could have said similar things on different occasions. And that's just like a devil anyway. That's the way he plays his game. He just keeps telling you the same thing until you give up. Or until he gives up. So that's not surprising. So when you study it in the Matthew's Gospel and you notice there's a change, don't say, I, 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 I. no, understand what Luke said. It happened over a period of 40 days. Praise God. All right. Now here's the interesting thing. So Jesus said to him, Satan, I said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Now notice, this on this occasion, when Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan, he didn't go. He didn't go. 
In the other story, he left. On this occasion, he didn't go. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, sometimes you say, get thee behind me, Satan. You think he's gone and he's not gone. You keep hearing the same thing. So when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Satan didn't go. Instead, he took him up and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. <laughs> cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, now Satan is quoting scripture. You know, now he's playing the same game. Jesus says, it is written. And Satan says, it is also written. <laughs> he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Uh. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said. You know what? Now he's not quoting logos to him. He gives him rhema. You see, as long as you, but the Bible says, the Bible says there'll be a continuous dialogue. Until you bring forth rhema rhema is the oh boy you know the bible says take unto you the shield of faith and what it says the sword of the spirit which is the rhema of god not the logos of god the sword of the spirit is the logos of god in your mouth that is rhema why because the bible tells us in hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 The Logos of God is living and active. The Logos of God is living and active. Then it says, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is living and active. But it will do nothing. When it comes to the wall until it comes out of your mouth jesus said let's look at the result verse 12 and jesus answering said unto him it is said thou shalt not tempt the lord thy god and when the devil had ended all the temptation he departed from him for a season he came another time meditate on the word that's the logos of God in my heart it's living and active it's active it's working in me now the logos of God is working in me now when I meditate and then I go to sleep the logos of God will be working in me living and active living and active he says it is more cutting than any two-edged sword it is more cutting When you meditate on the word of God, something happens inside you. Something happens in the realm of the spirit. You know what I like about the word like this? It's the fact that it shows me I can change anything. It shows me I'm not a victim in life. I'm not a victim in life. It shows me I don't have to I don't have to worry about tomorrow I can change anything you see when you understand that your future is actually in your hands and not in the hands of God you know for many people that that that, that shakes them up it, it gets them almost scared they say what how can I be responsible for my future yeah you are responsible 
Did you know your life is in your hands? You say, oh, my life is in the hand of God. Yes. Listen, you are the custodian of your life. You are the custodian. What happens to you is in your mouth. That's why in Romans chapter 12, when you read from verse 1 into verse 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. Look at he didn't say that God will present. He said, you present your body. You present your body. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of worship. He says, present your body. God will not do it for you. Present your body as a living sacrifice. You present it. You are the one to do it. Then in the second verse, it says, and be not conformed to this world. Oh, hallelujah. Be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured. The word is metaphor. It means to be metamorphosed. It means a change of state. It's a change of state. It says, be transfigured by the renewing of your thinking, the renewing of your mind, that you may prove for yourself in your own life what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? He says, you prove the will of God in your life. Ah. So I say, oh God, reveal your will in my life. No. The Bible says you are to prove it in your life. Be not, go, go there, Romans chapter 12. Look at it for yourself. Turn in there quickly. Have you seen it? All right, read it for me. From verse 1 into, into verse 2. Hallelujah. He says, and be not conformed to this world. Now, when he says, you present your body a living sacrifice, what does that tell you? That you're in charge of your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But you are, what is he doing in, oh. Hello? Did you ever read in, in um, 2 Corinthians, I believe chapter 6, when you read in the 16th verse, where the Lord says, uh, I will walk in you, I will dwell in you and walk in you, and um, be your God and you shall be my people. Did you ever read that? So, he dwells in us. Then he says, I'll dwell in you and I'll walk in you. I'll walk in you. So the Holy Spirit is inside us. Okay? And yet, I am the custodian of this body. In other words, if there's something happening to my body, I am responsible. Now, I shouldn't say, Oh God, how did, why did this happen? Why? I should give the word. I should give the word. And the Spirit of God will bring it to pass. He functions inside me. And he's ready to make sure everything that is necessary for a godly life is available to me. Because he says, I will walk in you. To walk in you, the word used there is emperipatio. What it means is to perambulate. It means that God is perambulating in you. You know what it is to perambulate? It means that it's like a soldier that's walking up and down at the border. Around where the fence is. And he keeps moving up and down and he's checking the fence. Checking the fence. To make sure everything is still in place. If something has gone wrong, he will fix it. Or he would renew it. 
That's his job. He keeps parambulating there. So he says, I will aim peripatio in you. I'll be walking up and down in the border. And where is the border of your life? Your body. So all over your body, you got the power of the Holy Ghost from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. He's so close you can touch him. So you feel some things, you know, some problem in your body. Say, hey, out. Ah. And when you do, the power of the Holy Ghost will be right there. Because he's parambulating in you. Listen, God's plan is to make us to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. He wants every one of us to be like Jesus. You know, when you say be like Jesus, he's talking about in likeness. He's not talking about the length of his hair. He's not talking about his beards. Are you hearing me? For the kingdom of God is not in observation. It doesn't come by observation. So you're not going to be looking at, okay, how was Jesus doing his hand? Was he doing his hand like this? No, that doesn't matter. God is a spirit. So this whole thing is spiritual. But I got the life of God in me. Every fiber of my being. Every bone of my body. Then you, you know, you, you, you understand the language. Let me remind you of something. You know, the, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter number 6. When you look at verse 1. Was I, was I reading something else before? Huh? Was I reading something else before and then I stopped somehow? What was it I was reading to you? <laughs> Romans chapter 12? Okay, all right, you, you got that, right? Okay, all right, now, um, Hebrews chapter 6. Glory to God. Makidabaha. <laughs> I'm reading from verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. <laughs> That's what I want you to see. God's desire. He says, let's not, you know, that there, there are some principles of the doctrine of Christ. I tell people, we, we should get beyond the level of living bad for the good. We should be living the good for the best. Are you hearing me? The different levels of life. For example, we talk about health. You know, uh, you, you may have been, uh, you've come to a level in your life where you know about uh, divine healing. And you're so glad about divine healing. My goodness, thank God for divine healing. I get healed every time there's trouble, I get healed. Praise God, hallelujah. But what does the Bible say about divine healing? It says healing is the children's bread. It's the children's bread. So you move on to the next level. What's the next level? Divine health. Divine health. That's the next level. But there's a third level. Are you listening? See, divine health is not the best that God offers. There's something more. Uh, let me ask you a question so you can get the picture. How healthy is God? It's insultive to say that God is healthy. Because you're bringing him to the level where you can qualify his level of health. How healthy is God? He said, my God is very healthy. That's an insult. Listen, cats don't bark, right? They don't bark. Now, that doesn't mean that we may not come across a cat that barks. We could, especially in Africa. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw a cat barking. But you know what? I know what I'll do. I'll go after that cat. Because it's not supposed to bark. 
So cats, we don't say cats can't bark, we say cats don't bark. They don't bark. Now, let's remember the language that James used. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. What is about the elders of the church that James knew about? What, what is about the elders of the church? The elders of the church there, he wasn't talking about the oldest people in the church. He was talking about those whom Paul said they have used the word of God. They have experienced the glory of the kingdom. They have handled the word of life. For those kind of people, the Bible says it is impossible if they backslide to ever come back. They don't backslide. You come to a point in your life, you understand that this kingdom is real. That what we have got from God, like John says, ye are of God, little children. Ye have overcome them. Don't try to overcome. Ye have overcome them for a reason. He says, because, not because you tried, not because you fought hard. He said, because greater is he that is in you. I want you to look at his reasoning. He says, ye are of God, little children. Ye have overcome them. And he gives you the reason you have overcome them. Not because you struggled hard. Not because you were so powerful. He said, because of what is inside you. In other words, it's a natural phenomenon. Because greater is he that is in you. He is telling you there's a rock inside you. Because of that, he says, you have overcome them. You didn't fight them to overcome them. He said, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's why he said, count it all joy. James, James said, count it all joy when you go through diverse days. He said, count it all joy. Now, this is the same James that says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Because the elders don't get sick. He's not talking about divine health there. He's saying it does happen. It's not a question of, the Bible says, they that dwell therein shall not say, I am sick. They shall not say so. Why? It's not in their language. Somebody said one time that, I don't understand. When people are sick, I pray for them, they get well. But when I'm sick, I pray for myself, I don't get well. I don't understand. Because you are a Nepios. That's why. Because when you are still a Nepios, you don't understand that. Hello? We need to understand what Christ has done for us. And we, 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 we should be bold about what he's done. You know, until you study the Bible, words like this will look like, are these things really so? Are we not just boasting? All this boasting. Hmm. Sickness, you grab somebody. <laughs> See? Can't just be boasting like this. Someone just be boasting like this, boasting like this. You should be careful. <laughs> this Bible, they've been preaching it for a long time. Oh. <laughs> ha. You know what's happening there? Satan has brought fear into that person's life and trying to stop him. From taking what belongs to him. Paul wrote a letter to Timothy and he said, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He said, Be strong in the grace. 
he said that the gospel has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel he has brought life zoe and immortality to light through the gospel No, look at yourself again. Look at yourself. Uh, you look at you. You're looking down. I said, look at yourself. You're looking like this. <laughs> There's more to you than the body that is sitting there. Did you hear that? There's more to you than the body that is sitting there. You are of God. Hallelujah. Get this. Did you know that you are the righteousness of God? Do you know the meaning of that? We have understood a lot about being the righteousness of God, meaning that uh, uh, God has made us righteous. But there's more to that. I want to give you two scriptures there that you need to study and look at very carefully. The first one I think you are thinking about is Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and then verse 17. Okay, let's read Romans chapter 5 verse 1 first. Read it for me. One, two, go. Hallelujah. He says, being what? Justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. That means declared righteous by faith. We have peace with God. I hope I can take a few minutes on that. Let's go to the next verse. Chapter, uh, verse 17. Same book, same chapter. Read it for me. Verse 17. Uh huh. <laughs> Listen, look at the difference. Look at something. In the first one, he says, Being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the 17th verse, it says, There which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. In other words, they shall reign as kings in life by one Jesus Christ. Why? Because they receive righteousness. Yeah. They were made righteous. Now, I want you to look at the terminology there in those two and then go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Are you there? Okay, read verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Oh God. Oh. Can you take this? You sure you can take this? <laughs> he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Oh. Listen. God made Jesus to be sin for us. And he says, and Jesus knew no sin. Now this is the doctrine of substitution. He made him to be seen for us. Listen, he didn't say he made him to be seen sacrifice. I want you to understand what we are being told here. He made him to be seen for us. He not only became our sin bearer, he became fully identified with sin. Which means our very nature before God was sin. We were characteristically sin. And he made Jesus to be sin for us. A man who knew no sin. Then he says that we might be made 
he didn't say that we might be made righteous which is already very powerful that's what we read in the first two verses in Romans but that we might be made the righteousness of God I, I want, listen to this he declared us righteous he declared us justified meaning when you became a Christian born again that is you were justified meaning that you it was not forgiveness you got it wasn't forgiveness you got it wasn't remission you got you already had remission when Jesus died the death of Jesus brought remission the new creation is not the one that just got remission no when Jesus died you got remission the whole world had remission second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19 tells us so the whole world got remission when you gave your heart to Christ and became born again your origin was the resurrection not the cross your origin was the resurrection not the cross so you became a new creation a new person altogether without a past that's what the Bible says you are justified meaning you are declared not guilty you don't understand this this is different from forgiveness he says justified meaning acquitted he says you're not guilty you committed sins before you were born again but because now that you're born again you are a new person he says you are not the same person that committed those sins the one that committed those sins is dead you are born again with a new life so he says discharged and acquitted not guilty so you are declared righteous so you walk away righteous justified now as powerful as that is then it comes to verse 21 of chapter 5 and 2nd Corinthians and he just he oh. sometimes you know when I study the Bible I say Lord when are we when are we going to when are we going to get enough of this stuff and, and look, look, look at what's there he says that we might be made he had made him to be seen for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that means I am the expression of God's righteousness oh God look at this you go to Hebrews in chapter 1 when you study this where it says that Jesus Christ was the effulgence of his glory the express image of his person now when Jesus showed up he said I and my father are one what audacity Wow how could he speak like that I and my father are one they said master show us the father and we'll be satisfied he said have you been such a long time with me and you haven't known me Philip he that has seen me has seen the father in other words I look like the father why because I am the express image of his person now what did we read in the 29th verse of the 8th chapter of the book of Romans that God's desire is for us to be conformed to the image of God's son who is the exact replica of the father what does that make us the father's dream listen understand the principle of the of the New Testament given to us if we don't say it we cannot become it the principle of the New Testament is that it's called the mirror principle you say it and you see it you see it and you say it you are the reflection of what you see you are the reflection of what you say what you say is what you get 
He gives us the word, the revelation of the word, so that we can proclaim it. Because we can only become it in our proclamation of it. Are you hearing me? The more we say it, the more we become it. That's the word of God given to us. Are you still there? Until we learn it and declare, I aim the righteousness of God, I will never walk as the righteousness of God. This is the principle of the word of God. Until I declare, he has made me righteous, I will never live a righteous life. Listen to this. There are people who are struggling to live a righteous life. If you say to them, you are righteous. They say, I'm not righteous. Only God is righteous. But God has given you his life. Hey, hey, hey I'm not righteous. I'm trying to be. You will never become. If you could be without him, you would have been without him. What will you do to become righteous? Tell me, how, how will you live your life to become righteous? It is not possible. Only a righteous man can live a righteous life. If you are not already righteous, you will never live righteously. Right living is a result of righteousness. So if you are already righteous by nature, which means what we read in the 17th verse of the 5th chapter, book of Romans, that they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, the gift of righteousness, meaning righteousness is a gift. So they which receive it shall reign in life. They which reject it will walk in condemnation. Hallelujah. So if you have received it, then you're going to reign in life. And now this big thing that he says, that he has made him to be seen for us, who knew no sin, that we might be the expression of his righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is mind-blowing. I am the, oh Lord, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How can I take this? How can I think it? It's so big for my mind, but yet my spirit can absorb it. I am the righteousness of God. Oh, hallelujah. You see, I didn't make it so. He said it, and all I had to do was to homologize it. To confess it and endorse it. That's all I had to do. He said it that we might boldly say That I am the righteousness of God. What is righteousness? Righteousness is the rightness. I want you to understand. This is too, this is, this is big. This is big. When I say I'll never fail in my life. This is what I'm talking about. See, there are things we say and people don't understand how we came about our theology. Our sunnesis. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This is it. Hallelujah. He said that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What is righteousness? Righteousness is the rightness of God. The, the, the correctness of God in us. It is the perfection of God in us. The accuracy of God in you. Now he says that we might be made the perfection of God in the earth. This is no surprise. It's the same thing that Peter said. I'll read it to you in a moment. I am the righteousness of God. Which means I can do the right thing the first time. I can. See, what we need to do, a lot of us have, have made lots of blunders in life for many reasons. We're not listening. A lot of us have never learned to listen. So we make blunders. We've never learned to listen. As you learn to listen to your spirit, you know how to take the right steps. So the more you listen to your spirit, the better guidance you will have in life. Learn to listen to your spirit. Because the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So there's where God guides you. Why do you go to the wrong place? Why are you asking the wrong man for the thing that you want? Why are you in the wrong office waiting five hours? For what is not coming and you don't know it's not coming because you're not listening to your spirits if we learn to judge from our spirits we will function as what god has said about us the righteousness of god in christ jesus that is where the perfection of god is that is where the correctness the accuracy oh lord so when i if, if i'm the one to lay this rock 
Because I am the righteousness of God. His perfection will be revealed in me. I will do it so perfectly. So that by the time you come and look at it, you say, who did this thing? You see, you've got to let the righteousness of God be awakened in you. Drown your humanity and let up your divinity. Are you still there? Because you are as much divine as you are human. That's what the Bible shows us. It says we are partakers of the divine nature. We are partakers. In other words, the word there is participators in the divine experience. In other words, we can walk in divinity while we're in this world. This is not too much for us. It is God's plan. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 2. Mando Gobo Sataya. Glory to his name forever. Hallelujah. Say this with me. I'm getting greater by the day. Can you read for me? First Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you notice the tenses? He didn't say, this is, is this future tense, past tense, or present tense? Okay, is this a promise? What is it? A statement of fact. That means a present hour reality. It is operative now. It says, but he not going to be ye are <laughs> glory to God that means that's my confession do you know Christianity was called the great confession glory to God all right go ahead read it for me verse 9 one to go mm -hmm. I I uh-huh If you thought that was nice, let me read it to you from the Amplified. <laughs> but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people. Then it says that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections. Can you see our calling? We are called to display the virtues and perfections of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous lights. To display his virtues. Humility is a virtue. Boldness is a virtue. Faith is a virtue. Hope is a virtue. This is wonderful. To display the virtues and perfections of him who has called us. See, this is our calling. It's not going to happen in heaven. It's here. To the Philippians, Paul wrote, holding forth the word of life. Holding forth the word of life. Hallelujah. You see, the more you understand this and meditate on it and proclaim it, the more you live it. You'd find it working in you. Like David said, Thou has made me a wonder. He has made you a wonder to your world. You are a wonder. You are a wonder. Are a wonder. 
as you walk in the light of this those who know you be looking at you like what's happened they can't understand they can't understand how can your life just be galloping forward like this whoosh, whoosh, always moving forward you say that's my calling progress is your calling success is your calling can you shout amen somebody hallelujah so when you pray you say blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has made me a wonder hallelujah hallelujah to display the virtues and perfections to display 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 hallelujah no wonder no wonder in the Bible you know where it says the fruit of the Spirit all right and you know we've heard a lot of people preaching that for years about the gifts and the fruits they say the gifts are not important the fruits are important the gifts of the Spirit are not as important as the fruit of the Spirit by their fruits you shall know them not by the gift that's rubbish when Jesus said by their fruits he meant the totality of all that's coming out of them everything about them that's what Jesus is talking about and in Galatians chapter 5 where we talked about the fruit of the Spirit didn't you notice he used a singular term he said the fruit of the Spirit is and Jesus didn't say by the fruit you shall know them he said by their fruits you shall know them. so all of them listed about our attitude and character in Galatians chapter 5 represent only one fruit and the Bible also say says uh, the fruit of the Spirit and because the capital S is used there can you turn to it maybe I should show it to you Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 read verse 22 for me one to go go on meekness uh-huh against such there is no law all right what did you see in verse 22 but the fruit of fruits fruit of the spirit is you see that okay now did you notice it's a capital S all right now what many people have thought about that because it's a capital S because they say write God's name with a capital G if you write God's name with a small G they say ah they think God is angry I told you last time about the Jews if they to write the name of God they will go and have their bath first after bathing then I'll come and write it if they come across it again ah, they go back and have their bath now this is real we're talking about those who who copied the the scriptures as they copied as they made the copies each time they came to where the name of God was they stopped and went to have their baths after bathing they came to continue and then they got there they stopped again so if you had that name seven times on that page you had your bad seven times <laughs> that's how righteous they were you are writing only capital G and you think that is very respectful to God okay <laughs> you haven't started having your bath yet <laughs> So just because it's a capital S, they think it, it meant the, the Spirit of God. Because um, that's the way they think. Small S 
for spirit means for human spirit and then capital S for God but really that that's an error from uh, the translators because if that's what they wanted to tell us about capital or small letter then they were wrong there because the Holy Spirit does not bear fruit there's no way in the scripture that suggests that he does so this here actually refers to the recreated human spirit the spirit of man your spirit that's born again remember the words of Jesus I am the vine ye are the branches where do you find the fruit the branches he didn't say I am the vine and the Holy Ghost is the branch you are so we are the fruit bearing part of the vine and the interesting thing there is Jesus said I am the vine here the branches meaning that we have the same life the branches and the vine have the same life and they have the same name no no see how your life would be wonderful all the way Thank you, Lord Jesus. What if you have some habits that you're trying to stop and you have problems with these habits? You know, I was preaching to a gentleman one day while he was smoking. And he went up. And I didn't say anything about his smoking. He just kept on smoking and I was talking. And then he thought, Isn't, doesn't he notice I'm smoking? <laughs> then when I wouldn't say anything about his smoking, he said, um, um, I believe everything you're saying but I can't stop this thing I said you don't have to stop it he thought oh I said haven't you tried to stop it before he said I've tried many times I couldn't stop it I said now you can't stop it so you don't have to worry <laughs> shocked Because you see, he was thinking he has to drop that first. He has to stop it first before Christ can, if, if you could clean yourself for God first, before God came, then you don't need him. <laughs> receive him first. When you receive him, he'll clean you up. <laughs> Hallelujah. He'll clean you up. You don't have to start reporting yourself. Oh Lord God, I would have been serving you if not because of this my problem. You know me now. You know me Lord. You know me now. <laughs> Somebody said to me, See, I want to be a Christian. But um, I want to, um, I have another trip I want to make first. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, um, I, I want to believe but I still have a trip I want to make. So I don't understand what you mean. And we're sitting down and facing each other. I don't, I don't understand what you mean. He said, mm, okay, let me just tell you, you are a pastor. So, I carry drugs. I said, oh, is it that one? He thought, oh. I said, oh, is it that one? You don't have to go for that trip first. Now let's finish with this one. He thought for a moment he knew it was a smart one. He, he said, if I give my life here, I know if he'd go for that one. <laughs> you see, he got the idea. You give your heart to Christ first. He handle that. Now, some of you have been there in meetings where I gave an order call for those who were carrying guns. I remember one time we were having a meeting from a campground, and about thirteen or fifteen young people waited behind who've been carrying guns. They kill people, and I sat down to talk with them, young guys. I think there were about three girls among them or so. 
I sat down with them. I said, what? What are you doing with the guns? Why do you have to kill somebody? And they're looking at me like, Maybe you're here now, and you got one. <laughs> say, no matter what they say, okay, my own self-defense. Anyway, I didn't say you shouldn't have self-defense. What I want to say to you is this. I know you're here. And God wants to save you from destruction. He wants to save you, save your life from destruction. And I'd like to pause there at this moment. You've been living a terrible life. You've been living a murderous life. A wicked life. But tonight, you want Christ to save you. To take you away from this direction of darkness and destruction in which you've been traveling. I want you to stand up wherever you are. Stand up now. You want salvation from Christ. You can't continue the way you're doing now. You can't fight for yourself. You can't save yourself. Only the word of God can take care of you. Only the word of God. So no matter where you are right now, stand up. Because God wants to change your life. Thank you. I want to pray for you. Now don't be ashamed. Anyone else who's living the same kind of life and you want, you're saying, I'm done with it. I want the kind of life Pastor Chris has talked about tonight. You want that life. You can have it tonight. And here, I would ask you to come forward. Young man, come, come here. There's room for you in Christ. There's room for you in Christ. There's no better way. There's no better way.